Hello and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, February 21st, 2018. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week, we're going to be talking about the upcoming SpaceX launch, the Leaning Tower of SLS, how James Webb will take pictures, the chances of a Tesla meteor, and why people would be totally chill about aliens. Joining me this week, Dr. Morgan Renberg, Director of Scientific Presentation at the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History. Morgan, how's it going? Hey, it feels good to have everybody back. The world feels like it's right again. <laughs> we got the we got the band back together. We've got Dr. Kimberly Cartier, Earth and Space Science reporter for EOS Magazine. Kimberly. Hey, Fraser. Happy podcast day. Happy podcast day to you too. It's my favorite day of the week. <laughs> Dr. Paul M. Sutter, an astrophysicist at Ohio State and the host of Ask Spaceman. Dr. Paul Sutter. That's me. Also back from Iceland. I'm here. I'm here. And back. Yeah. It happened. We were there. It was real. I heard you and Fraser wrestled. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We put on a show because we were locked in the hotel room yeah. and there was only one uh, bowl of lamb stew left. And uh, everyone made us fight for it because they thought that'd be really great. Yeah. Uh, and the winner not only got the bowl of lamb stew, but also $100. And eternal bragging rights. There was lamb offered at every single meal. There was a lot of lamb. You know, Iceland say what you, say what you want about their cuisine, but their soup game is on point. <laughs> Suddenly, I'm much more interested in going to Iceland. See? See? It's all about the soups. It's about the, the hidden gems of a country. It's not like the geysers or the aurora or the glaciers or whatever. It's about the soups and stews. And, the lamb. and this is our special guest, Dr. Jesse Christensen. Hi. So normally, for the people listening to this, we do the interview first, and then we let our guest fly and be free. Uh, today, uh, Jesse wanted to stick with us and uh, talk about some of the other events as well. So we're going to put the interview deeper into the show, and instead, sort of, we're going to make the show the way it sounds as a podcast. And if that makes any sense to anyone, congratulations. It barely made sense to me. So uh, let's get into uh, the stories for the week. All right. So first up, uh, Morgan, let's talk about the upcoming SpaceX launch where we all get some internet. It was not supposed to be an upcoming launch. It was supposed to have yeah. already Last launched Last Saturday's today. launch that got delayed. Till today that got delayed till tomorrow so we'll see if it launches but it's a pretty cool mission when it finally does go up because it's doing a couple of new things well one it's launching just a plain old boring satellite uh it's amazing to say that that's boring the second thing though is that it's testing out a new uh payload fairing and the fairing is basically that housing at the top of the rocket that contains whatever it is you're spending sending to space and it, it's what basically is the windshield for your fragile satellite inside and they have a new sort of more efficient design for that. Uh, and what's really cool is that now they're going to try to recover the payload fairing too. And they showed some pictures for the first time uh, today, I think, that showed this sort of crazy drone ship with a net on top of it. <laughs> and they're either going to try to catch, yeah, why not? They're either going to try to catch the payload fairing in the net and Failing that, they can they can like flip it over and use it as a giant like strainer and basically just strain the ocean to uh, to get it, and they'll then drag that back to to shore. Now the and that's, fairing is, I mean, when the fairing detaches from the rocket, they're going to come down on parachutes. They could drift anywhere, You're, right? How are how are they going to be able to control that these things are going to land? On, I think I think the drone the 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 net's name is Steven I believe I believe the net so. has a name it's, it's I think of it's called it it's because Mr Steven Mr Steven, Steven something like that <clears throat> yeah um, they haven't really said a lot about how this is going to work normally the payload fairing just falls back into the ocean and is you know home for fish forever so I guess we'll find out how how exactly it's going to play out because you're right you know. Once, you know, the fair fairing is like the last thing that comes off. So it's drifting from like stupidly high and it's going to have a parachute bringing it down. It could go basically anywhere. And maybe they're just hoping it's going to get lucky 
and come down where their boat can go and find it? We're going to have to find out. Um, and that's, but that's just one piece of this mission. The other piece of this mission is like the first baby step towards what's a huge undertaking for SpaceX. And that is launching two test satellites uh, for what will ultimately be a 4,000 satellite uh, internet service provider network. I, I, um, they're sorry, calling it I, Starlink. I hate to, to fact check you on this, but apparently it's, oh, called, no. it's, it's up to 12,000. 12,000. Oh gosh. Just just shy of 12,000 satellites. All right. Well, so as of like satellites are up there right now. Like does 12,000 appreciably like double it or there's a Oh, I would think that would 2, do 2,000 yeah, much satellites more. up there right now. Wow. So we're talking about a lot. Um so they're going to be and... dominating the satellite game. Yeah. yeah, it's a good thing that they have the cheapest way to get to space. And really <laughs> it's hard to imagine how another company could sort of operate at this uh, this frequency. So here's the big idea, is the idea is let's sort of, we have all these different ways of communicating right now. We have like cable, we have s other satellite internet, we have cell phones. Let's just get rid of all of that. And basically anywhere on planet earth, let's have an ultra high speed connection. They're talking about a gigabit per second, basically anywhere a human being lives on earth. Uh, with a latency of just 25 or 35 milliseconds. So it's basically like a, a fiber network that you might have to your house, but literally going to your phone or going to your computer wherever you are on Earth. I mean, from what I understand, and, that, that first iteration, it's going to be more like a box as opposed to yeah, necessarily this, going no, this straight is, into this a is phone. Sort of the, but, yeah, this yeah. is sort of a long-term yeah. long vision here. The first one's going to be like a modem, and you'll be able to you know, put it somewhere and suck in uh, internet and, you know, put it through your Wi-Fi router. And it won't seem that different uh, in, in phase one, other than wherever you live in the world, you're suddenly going to have a new competitor in your service provider uh, market. And so you might wonder, like, why, why hasn't anyone else, like, what's so different about this and other satellite uh, technology? Yeah, the and radiums. it's basically, they're, exactly, they're putting these satellites way closer to Earth. So a normal satellite internet is delivered by satellites in geosynchronous orbit around uh, the Earth, about 35,000 kilometers away. And that's great because you don't need a lot of satellites because you just sort of have, you know, a few dozen satellites spread around and wherever you are, you're in view of one of those satellites. But because you're 35,000 kilometers away, it takes, you know, the radio waves quite a long time to reach you and then for you to turn around and send back. And so you often get latencies of over a second once you factor in all of the different pieces. And the way SpaceX is going to defeat this is by putting this, bringing those satellites closer. It's kind of the dumbest, simplest solution. Uh, so they're going to have their satellites at 1,000 kilometers instead of 35,000 kilometers. But the closer you get to Earth, the faster those satellites are moving. And so the more of them you have to have to, in order to keep an, an, a reasonable number of them in sight of your internet sucking inbox at any given time. And so they're going to have thousands of these things so that you're always seeing a bunch of them and there's enough capacity for your, for your signals to be networked, right? You know, if you have too many people buy a cell tower, then your cell phone speed starts slowing down. Well, now like literally the whole world is in view of this service. So they have to have enough capacity to, to carry all of that. And so they're gonna have thousands of these things uh, zipping around the earth and they'll have to replace them like hundreds a year basically. And the idea is to have the whole system up and running by 2024. Uh, and so this launch is gonna send the really, first two, quick. yeah, the, fir the well, first two I mean, satellites. Like every SpaceX announcement is always next yeah. week. <laughs> Yeah, right. Right. You know, this is Elon time, but the, they're launching these first two that are going to 500 kilometer orbits to test uh, b the basic idea of the transmitter, the receiver, the basics of the satellite, all of that. And they've already received approval from the U.S. Federal Communications Commission to operate this network. And so it's basically as soon as they can start producing final satellites, they can start throwing them up. And these are going to be pretty small things. So you can imagine just chucking like hundreds of them on a Falcon Heavy. 
and blasting them all up at once. And that's what makes it possible to have, you know, 12,000 satellites in a network where you're having to replace 10% of them every year. You know, if you had to launch those, you know, 10 at a time, that's a, like a stupid number of launches. But if you can launch them hundreds at a time, then this actually sort of becomes feasible to do. So part of this that I think is so fascinating is that they're just one group. I mean, SpaceX's version of this is just one of many groups that are looking to deliver a space internet. And so you've got their constellation and potentially, I think I saw upwards of eight other constellations in the works from different organizations, including Iridium and others. They're all going to want to use SpaceX rockets because that's the cheapest game in town. I, I mean, I mean, one, what if SpaceX completely destroys the the worldwide telecommunications industry by by offering internet at a fraction of the price because they own the satellites and the launchers? But two, they also make a boatload of money because they are supplying launches to all these other satellite networks who will be competitors. It it. Like, I think that this is going to be one of the most disruptive things that's happened in in telecommunications in a long time. And it's going to get crowded and crazy really quickly. It's certainly going to be the biggest consumer-facing thing that SpaceX has done. And sort of the, the first payback on the promise that we've been saying for years, that reusable rockets are going to revolutionize access to space. And access to space is going to revolutionize something for for average people. And question this mark, is... Question mark, question mark. Right. This is page one in, in that that's something. And you're right. It's not just SpaceX. It's all these other companies. And so we could be looking at, you know, after 50 years of, you know, 60 years of space flight, we have a couple thousand satellites up in space. You know, in the next 20 years, we could see 10 times that many satellites go up. Well, and that's a whole different thing. I mean, I could tell you one thing is that if astronomers were annoyed by that one little disco ball that was launched from New Zealand, <laughs> yeah. this off is all hell when all yeah. these communication satellites go up. Yes. Yeah, iridium flares are not going to be that exciting anymore when there's like a thousand right. of them in the sky at any time. Yeah, it'll be but, but think about the. Oh, go be. ahead, Jesse. Sorry, I was just saying it'll be interesting to know what magnitude they're going to be like visually. Well, I, uh, an astronomer friend that I have uh, took some some photos of the Rosette Nebula as it was moving through the plane of the of where all the geosynchronous satellites are and you could see them slicing through his mm -hmm. image because they were all sort of in the same in the same area and those are geosynchronous which is uh what 40 thousand 35,000 yeah, yeah right and so they're going to be bright but they're small so the, each of these satellites is going to be fairly small, but it's going to be, I, I, I think you're exactly right, Kimberly. It's going to, it's going to be a, it's going to be obnoxious. It's going to be right. the worst for astronomers. Yeah, absolutely. I wonder if there's going to be like a light pollution I, I thing mind. for, for that. Will it matter? Because at that point, light pollution will have already stolen all of the night sky from everyone around the earth. And then like cares? iridium flares are only that way because they had the, like this really distinctive design of their solar panels. So maybe, you know, maybe Nat, there's, you know, you don't see that from other, you, you see it from the ISS, which is, you know, the size of a football field, but not from most other satellites. So maybe there's going to be some sort of regulation saying, Paint the black. You, know, you have to des design your satellite for low visibility from Earth, uh, just so that the night sky isn't like a disco uh, every single night. Like a super low albedo. You hey, gotta... Speaking of the ISS, is anybody worried about how close these first two are going to be to the ISS? So I just Googled it and the ISS is at 400 kilometers and these are going to be at 500 kilometers, meaning potentially they could occasionally be 100 kilometers away That's from like the ISS. That's like 100, 100 whole kilometers. That's a uh, lot The ISS of routinely like dodges space debris. And so I think if they were going to proposing to put 4,000 satellites at the ISS altitude, I think probably there would be some cause for concern. Uh, but adding a couple of, of things like this is just, you know, that's everyday business for working in low Earth orbit. All right. Uh, but, of course, this is all on Musk time. Who knows whether it's actually going to happen? Uh, we need to just stay tuned, I guess. Um, Kimberly. 
Yeah, so moving from an incredibly streamlined and awesome uh, rocket system to an incredibly cumbersome and really disappointing one, in my opinion, uh, NASA's mobile launcher for its space launch system, which it has been working on for nearly a decade and has spent is going to spend nearly a billion dollars for this one launch tower, it's leaning. <laughs> and not only is it leaning, but it's slightly bending and twisting, and they're not going to fix it. Granted, they say that it's not going to cause a technical problem when they eventually attempt to launch uh, an SLS in 2020-ish on NASA time. Uh, grant they And they have a backup plan if it is, but this is a tower that they've been working on for a decade to modify it from its original purpose to with an Ares rocket to now the SLS and it's taking forever and it's costing more and more and more and it may only be ever used once That's and it's leaning. Part. <laughs> it's leaning. I mean, I mean, I think we've said before we're getting spoiled with the idea of being able to reuse rockets and reuse systems with SpaceX, but I mean, you should be able to use a launch tower more than once, right? <laughs> they, I've seen pictures of this thing. This. What is mobile about it? This thing seems mobile like the you know, plate tectonic plates are mobile. So originally, originally, I will say it was meant to be uh, relatively light and on actual like a platform that could actually move on giant wheels. I'm not exactly sure the purpose of that, but it, it was originally designed to be mobile many, many iterations ago. And then during this modification process to go from uh, <clears throat> launching the original set of rockets that it was designed for a decade ago to now the SLS, which is much bigger. They've added on so many uh, additions to modify it for these this new type of rocket that it's quite a bit heavier than it was ever intended to be. And if they ever have to make any of these corrections to correct the leaning and twisting, they're going to have to replace a bunch of the lightweight stuff with even more steel supports and make it, I think, almost a million pounds heavier than it was ever intended to be, which sort of scraps the whole mobile part of the mobile launch. Um, so I, I, it's just one of the, and and I will say the, the thing that gets me is that uh, the US government is trying to push the SLS more and more and more and taking up a huge chunk of NASA's budget to push this forward. And it's just continually disappointing. I mean, when I think about the one back with the space shuttle, right, it was this enormous tracked vehicle that started the vehicle assembly building and they'd stacked up the shuttle and it would roll out, crawl at whatever, a mile per hour, all the way out to the launch platform and then then the, the shuttle would launch from there. So is it the same kind of machine? Doesn't look like it has those sure. tracks. It has, doesn't it, look like it has the tracks. I mean, I, when it was built, it did, and then it moved down to Kennedy in Florida, and I'm not sure that it still does, but it still has the same name. I'm not entirely sure how all that works. But the 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 mobile launcher, when they realized that they had to modify it, or when they realized that they couldn't use it for its intended purpose because the rocket got canceled, uh, they could either have scrapped it and built a new one, or they could have modified it essentially. And at the time, modifying it seemed like the most financially efficient thing to do. It would have cost something like $20 million or something like that. And now it's, it has already cost more than 10 times that amount and is going to cost nearly a billion by the time it's ready to actually launch a, an SLS. And it seems like a tremendous just drain on NASA's budget. Hmm. Paul. And it's leaning. It's leaning. I've, it's I've actually seen. Well, I've actually seen some pictures where people have like photoshopped, you know, the like the, the mobile launcher into like the leaning tower of Pisa, and so people are like leaning up against it, it's turning quite, into it's ice cream cones and things. I guess pretty funny. Lean. But, it's a slight lean in the direction of where the rocket should be, and so if it leans any more, that's an issue. <laughs> but, Paul, tell us all, all about a space telescope that's totally on budget and totally on track. Uh, there is no such thing, so uh, I have nothing to say. <laughs> well, then let's talk oh, about I James. I have something to say. I have something to say there. So I work at the NASA Exoplanet Archive, and we once got a Group Achievement Award from NASA for delivering a product on budget. Nice. 
It was so <laughs> remarkable. It was so amazing that we had- Too bad the cost of the award put you over budget. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but I, I still have it here on my wall, just as a reminder of like how ridiculous this is. <laughs> Paul, tell us about James Webb. How's it gonna oh, there, work? There's this interesting article uh, that came out uh, talking about how James Webb image processing is going, or is it how we're beginning to think about James Webb image processing because it will be primarily an infrared telescope. It'll be observing stuff outside of the, the visible range of human vision. So with it being called the successor to the Hubble, there's a lot of public expectations for what it will deliver in terms of beautiful, spectacular, eye-popping visuals. Like Hubble is just so iconic. It's become a part of our culture to have these amazing pictures of stuff really far in space delivered by the Hubble. But how do you do that with an infrared telescope, with a telescope that's going to be looking at wavelengths of light that we can't see? How do you do that? Open you question. I will question. I've seen pictures from Spitzer. They look great. Yeah, and and that's, uh, but like, how are those images generated? Hubble images are basically fake too. So <laughs> you know, the amount of processing that goes into them is it, so extreme. But I mean, any right. images. You I mean, when... mapping. You do some mapping from that wavelength onto a an optical wavelength that we can understand. And I assume what they're going to try and do is a is like a uniform set so that they all have the same kind of visual look. The J the JWST palette. Exactly. I, I mean, you, exactly. you laugh, but my there's... husband who makes gal galaxy simulations has to make a mock HST palette for his galaxy simulations so they look like HST images. Uh, yeah, and, and there is going to be an incredible amount of discussion going into that palette of mapping infrared wavelengths to visible wavelengths so that to balance uh, visual aesthetics with the amount of information delivered in the image, because we are going to be looking at the at the raw images in addition to the spectra to try to get some interesting information, some science out of it. We want to deliver those images to the public so we can ooh and ah and all the cool stuff JWST is going to see. And there's a lot of competing forces that you have to balance in order to make a good looking image that is also faithful to the information that's actually acquired. It is not an easy thing. So who is it that makes those decisions? Who's the, who are the people that are working on this and figuring out what's the right color palette for JWST? I'm assuming it's going to be a committee that is going to end up arguing to the death over their favored colored palette. But it, I mean, even when you um, when you see pictures that are just on like on Instagram and things like that, and people haven't you know, or astrophotographers, they're using something like this uh, behind me using a telescope, and they've got like some kind of CCD camera that they're using. They've got different filters, and they'll be doing like a hydrogen alpha filter, and they'll be doing a sulfur filter and an oxygen filter. They'll be picking one color so hydrogen is red oxygen is blue and sulfur is green and then they make a picture and the whole thing is fake right i mean the i don't like the word fake no it's I don't true like the okay word fake. it is artificially constructed based on a completely arbitrary decision could, for what wavelength it's translated into into sure. a visual palette instead of you know and the vast majority I, I of the guess pictures we see. Guess, how about this analogy? How about this analogy of why I don't think it's fake? I don't think it's artificial. I don't think it's arbitrary. Is a translating a language. Like say there's a poem in French and you translate it into English. And there are many ways to translate the meaning of the original French poem into English. But it is still a mapping from the French to the English so that English speakers can read it. So... And but, not just read it, but understand what's meant yes. behind it. But they go through well, and this that's where situation. I think there's. Go ahead, Morgan. Yeah. So, uh, as someone on the front lines of educating the public about these very things, um, I can tell you that the artificial mappings cause can cause a tremendous amount of trouble. We have an exhibit at the, at the museum that shows live images of the sun from Solar Dynamics Observatory in all of their filters. 
and you can see all these different different neat structures on the surface of the fund and i would wager that 99 percent of people even though each one starts off by saying this view of the sun uh, looks at those and thinks that there are different stars that there are different planets because they're in you know the bright sdo color palette there's you know the bright orange the bright fuchsia the bright teal start 99 percent of our guests probably don't make the connection that they're seeing the same object that they know the sun and they think they're planets or stars or or, or whatever and that's almost entirely based on the color of of the object and so that it's a really tricky problem to solve well, you went with this as well back when you were dealing with Cassini, right? Because Cassini had this same setup where it had separate filters and took a lot of its images in infrared. Mm -hmm. And and then they would go and they would do things like they would say, we're going to use this nanometer for red, this nanometer for blue, this nanometer for green, make a, make a, a, a color image when all three wavelengths are invisible to the human eye and you're yeah, making on the, that color on the image. uv on the uv instrument we made the decision or i shouldn't say we because it was made before my involvement uh that all of those colors were going to be the brightest most obnoxious fake colors possible so that when you saw the rings lit up like the rainbow it was super duper trooper obvious that you were seeing something that was trooper. fake and 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 created uh, and so if you ever see a rainbow picture of Saturn's rings, it comes from uh, the ultraviolet instrument because all of those colors are outside of our view. And we didn't want to mislead people into thinking that this was at all what the rings actually looked like uh, if you were there with your eyes. So I guess, I mean, for you as astronomers, though, what is the, I mean, your main goal is to get the most science. So isn't that where this conversation should start? And end. It, it, it does start there, absolutely. But it there's so many things that go into color perception, and how different people see color, and how diff how uh, choices in color can affect <clears throat> uh, biases in how you see an image of what features tend to stand out and what might not, and the distance between colors contains very important information that you can either mask or enhance based on your chosen palette. So it is about, at the end of the day, you know, from a purely scientific view, you want an image that conveys as much information as possible. And it's very, very hard to pick the color palette that conveys as much information as possible. And it depends on instrument to instrument and even situation to situation. Should we have two palettes, one for public outreach and one for science? Why try to cram them all in to be a single palette for both very different tasks? Well, I think the other thing is you look at the work that, say, Kevin Gill, J Jason Major, and a bunch of other people are doing with the Juno data. They are creating these incredible images. They're processing these images using the, the underlying data to make very beautiful artwork out of these images of Jupiter that are better, I think, than the kinds of pictures that NASA has released. And so I think I would, I would hold that they just get this data out into the public as much as possible and let a lot of these people get their hands on it and and process them to their heart's content and let them figure out those what is the most aesthetically pleasing way to present these images probably but still nasa has to release images they can't just yeah. say here's here's the stark grayscale one do what you want <laughs> uh, nasa can't yeah. do that here's a boring NASA picture from a telescope that you that we that spent, spent 10 billion 10 dollars. billion dollars yeah. on and waited and forever even for internally, even to, internally do... to the community you you have to give you have to write papers with images in them you have to give presentations you you have to sell your work to the rest of the astronomers and you want an image that looks good because that's what's selling your work to the community yeah if anyone has ever sat through an hour-long presentation where all the images are just squiggly line graphs you need pictures it's you true. need them it's i true. haven't seen you've been to one of morgan's talks if i don't see pictures in no, oh, he's he he's the graph man uh if i don't see pictures in your uh, astro ph paper i'm not reporting on it that's i'm i'm for sure if i if there's not a picture in there that i can use 
then I'm not interested. All right. Well, I'm going to do just a quick mention, and then we're going to move on to our interview for the week um, with our special guest who's joined us all the way along. She was with us the whole time on this uh, journey on this journey <laughs> um so just a, just a quick mention just an update on the uh, the falcon heavy and this is that a group of researchers from university of toronto i think yeah calculated the chances of the <laughs> elon musk's tesla smashing into either the earth or venus and they did the calculations and they found that there is a six percent chance that over the next million years uh that 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 car is coming home or we're all gonna die by tesla in pieces thanks in, Musk. in pieces yeah so he thought that he had sent it far out into the solar system beyond the orbit of mars but it turns out when you throw things out they follow orbits and return close to the start wait a point. minute wait a minute we all agree it's common knowledge now that elon musk is a supervillain. So what if this is part of the plan where he launches a projectile, a high velocity projectile into orbit that maybe there is some way of controlling it. Maybe there's a little thruster on there that he can remotely control and he's going to hold the world hostage. Otherwise he's going to crash his, I'm going to say a nuclear powered Tesla into a major city. Isn't what? that the plot of Age of Ultron? What? what? I'm sure it is. <laughs> <laughs> what, what 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 would be the devastating impact of a car impact? smashing into the atmosphere at high velocity? Morgan. At least 500 horsepower. 500 horsepower. 500 horses. <laughs> 500 horses. Horse. It's way more than the four you need for an apocalypse. That's like... <laughs> <laughs> would it would it's it 125 apocalypse would it this is ridiculous. would we get to chelyabinsk not even right a fraction oh no it would it would almost surely burn up in the atmosphere uh the difference is an asteroid is like solid rock a car is mostly empty space on the inside according and, to the press and a lot of yeah and a lot of surface area I mean, if he's a supervillain, it's probably like a mega laser in there or something, and it opens mm -hmm. the trunk mm -hmm. of the car. And he did make that's jokes why there's the about trunk that. on the front of the Tesla. Yeah, he was. He did make a joke about trying to attach lasers to sharks at one point. So that could. Yeah, he be. jokes. Yeah, he, he jokes. jokes I, but he, he makes lots of he jokes that end up becoming joke. true. Yeah. Actually, there was one picture just released today. The f sort of a final picture of it three and a half million kilometers away someone was able to line up the shot and and get it just this tiny little dot moving through and then that's it we're not gonna hear anymore because it has no way to communicate back home all right well let's move on to this week's interview uh dr jesse christensen thank you for joining us on the weekly space hangout thank you for having me i'm really excited uh, who are you what do you do I'm a staff scientist at the NASA Exoplanet Science Institute, uh, and my the project support that I do is running the NASA Exoplanet Archive. So what? We've all made plots with that. <laughs> yeah. Hooray! Awesome archive. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> all right. So for, for for so for the people who aren't in the uh, exoplanet world, uh, what is the where is this database? What is its purpose? What's in there? What secret knowledge? So, this is how NASA keeps track of how many exoplanets we've found. So these are planets around other stars. And once there were enough of them that we wanted to keep track, they built the Exoplanet Archive, which was about 2011, slightly before I joined the team. Uh, so we scan the literature every day and we look for the published exoplanets or updated parameters or retracted exoplanets, which is happening more and more regularly as well. Uh, and then we just keep this large table and a whole bunch of tools and extra data and fun stuff. How many planets are there? Uh, as of this minute, 3,700. As of 10 a.m. tomorrow morning, I can tell you there'll be 3,704. Wow. Spoil we, just, we, we just got a scoop. Yep. <laughs> um, but and those are, those are like, like super duper confirmed planets? Oh, good question. Yeah, there's so, lots of like poorly yeah, confirmed planets, right? There are. Um, and there's also, we're at the point where there are multiple methods of confirmation. Uh, and one of them is statistical, and I'm, I'm using air quotes like statistics isn't a real thing, yeah. but... Um, what, magic. What, Might as well be magic. Statistics exactly. and magic, they're the same thing, yeah. So um, a lot of the Kepler planets, so there's something like 2,500 of those 3,700 
planets are from the Kepler mission or the K2 mission, its sequel. Um, they're too faint for us to ever measure their masses properly or well. So what people do is they statistically validate them where they compare the signal that we do see to signals of things that might mimic a planet, but not really be a planet and then decide how likely it is that it's a planet compared to not a planet. So they're all validated at quite high likelihood, 99.9% .9 typically. So, you know, but if there's 2000 of them, a few of them are really fake planets. Now, NASA's TESS spacecraft is going to be launching uh, in like a couple of months. Right? That's right, April. No, no earlier than April 16th. You're going to need a bigger behind. database. Yes, so actually that's what we've been working on under the hood here for a while because um, our underlying database of stars, which is the two mass all sky, the two the two micron all sky survey, um, is not is is doesn't have enough stars in it. So we're building we're moving to a bigger boat, uh, a bigger archive. So we're going to be using Gaia. So this is this ESA mission, European Space Agency launched this mission called Gaia, which uses space lasers to measure the positions of stars very accurately. And that's literally all I know, space lasers. Um, but it's going to produce a catalog of 1.5 billion stars. And that's going to be our underlying database. Uh, and that's much bigger than what we have. So we're scrambling to like refactor everything and find space. <laughs> right. Um, but, you know, so, so what for planet hunting machines are sort of coming out in the next little while that's going to fill your data with goodness. You talked about Gaia supplying all this star data, and we talked about tests, but there's a lot of other instruments, ground and space-based, that are helping find planets. Yeah, no, so actually we're about to, the next decade, we're going to see the number of exoplanets go up by maybe an order of magnitude. Uh, so the TESS mission, uh, which we just talked about, is predicted to find 23,000 planets. And that's not planet candidates, that's actual planets. So TESS is an all-sky survey. Uh, Kepler, which I mentioned, did a little patch of the sky. I'm pointing like you can, you, that's the patch right there. Um, but TESS is doing the whole sky. Uh, so that's why it's going to find so many more planets. Um, we also have the W-first mission, uh, if it doesn't get cut in the new budget, oh. which is kind of unnerving. Um, so the W first mission contains a large exoplanet component, which is a microlensing survey towards the galactic bulge. Uh, microlensing is a different technique, which relies on the bending of light by a planet as it passes in front of a very, very distant background star. Um, so it's predicted to find a few thousand microlensing planets, but just because it's going to be doing a survey of the bulge, it's predicted to find something like a hundred thousand transiting planets. And that's just like bonus. <laughs> um, there's also the ESA Plato mission, uh, which is kind of like Kepler on steroids. Uh, it's launching in the next decade as well. Uh, and it's going to do a couple of long stairs like Kepler did. And then also just, you know, tile the rest of the sky for fun while it's up there. Why not? <laughs> it's, uh, it's such a shame that Kepler failed too early and wasn't able to find that Earth-sized world orbiting a, a sun-like star. So anyone who's in the exoplanet research field, I like to ask them, place their bets. When will, when do you think they will announce the Earth-sized world orbiting a sun-like star within the habitable zone? Oh, that's a really good question. So none of the missions that I've just mentioned are actually sensitive to that kind of planet. Tess is only going to find short period things because Basically, if you do an all sky survey, you can't sit on it for the years and years and years. You need to find a planet like the Earth. Um, so maybe what I'll say is when Plato launches, one of its plans is to go back to the original Kepler field and stare at it for another year. And so it could be that some of these very weak signals that we see in the Kepler data, if you had another year with, with for instance, Plato, you might be able to actually dig out the signal and find the planet. I think that's something like 2024, 2026. And then the data will take a little while. So. 10 years from now, I'll place my bet. <laughs> okay. Wow, Kimberly, we so you, you must concur there. Oh, go ahead, Morgan. Ten, 10 years is a safe bet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> I'll go with that. So you, you must get people doing all sorts of things with your catalog. And I'm just kind of curious what the like cleverest or most surprising thing someone has taken the exoplanet database and done something with it. That's a really good question. So there was someone, um, now I'm going to forget their name and the name of their blog, much to my chagrin, uh, who 
he was basically trying to demonstrate how APIs are very powerful ways of getting data out of archives and then coming like straight into like a Jupyter notebook and then manipulating it and making plots. So he wrote this whole blog post where he was basically just like demonstrating to people, this is why APIs are cool and you should have them. And this is why this code is cool. Uh, and that was really neat because he didn't really, he wasn't an exoplanet. He wasn't even an astronomer, I don't think, but he found the archive and he realized it was API accessible and was just like, look at this cool stuff we can do. I thought that was really fun. Maybe someone should graph them, Morgan. Wow, imagine that. <laughs> um, we, we do provide all, a lot of plotting tools. Uh, so, so then one of, you know, you guys came across everyone in the space journalism world's radar within the last little while because <clears throat> some citizen scientists turned up some exoplanets in the Kepler data. Can you talk about that? Sure. So, um, uh, inspired by Planet Hunters, which was the original citizen scientist project using Kepler data, uh, myself and Ian, Co Ian Crossfield at MIT and Courtney Dressing at the University of California, Berkeley, started a project called Exoplanet Explorers. The idea being that uh, with the K2 data, K2 is the sequel to Kepler, um, the K2 data were coming down so fast we couldn't keep it up. Uh, and the human brain is really good at pattern recognition. So, and that's an evolutionary thing. It's very good for us to be able to tell things apart that look similar, like stripes and you know grass and tiger stripes. It's good to know the difference. Um, so what we did was we put up all of these uh, signals that our software had found in the K2 data. Um, and some of them look like planets and some of them don't look like planets. And it can be hard to explain to a computer why something looks like a planet and why that one is definitely a planet and why that one is definitely not a planet. Um, and machine learning is making a lot of strides in this direction, but uh, we also have the you know mechanical Turk option of just being like, hey, the crowd is really interested in helping us do this. So we just show you a few examples. Here's what planets looks like. Looks like. Here are what unplanets look like. Go sort. Um, and we were very lucky within two weeks of starting the project, we got featured on a television show called BBC uh, Stargazing Live. And uh, within the first 48 hours, we had 2 million classifications of our signals by about 10,000 volunteers. Uh, and one of the things they found in the first 48 hours was this system, which is now very unromantically called K2138. I'm so sorry. Um, it's a terrible name, but it has at least five planets around it, four of which were found by this original citizen science search. Uh, and then there's a fifth one. And then we think there's a sixth one. And I'm really excited. We have NASA Spitzer time. Spitzer is another infrared telescope that we just mentioned earlier this afternoon. Uh, so we have 12 hours of Spitzer time to go and chase down this sixth candidate. I'm really excited. And what kind of planets do you think they are? Is this sort of Trappist-esque? Oh, so these are a little bit bigger. Um, there are most of the planets we've found so far are between the size of Earth and Neptune. And that's really interesting because there's nothing in our solar system between the size of Earth and Neptune. So it's strange that we go out there and this is like the, like the bulk of what we found is these size planets. Um, and that means we, we're still learning what they are, like whether they're big rocks or whether they're little ice balls like Neptune. Um, so what these planets are, they range from 1.6 to 3.3 times the radius of the Earth. So they fall into this super earth mini neptune uh regime because uh, neptune is four times the size of the earth so they're in this thing so the 1.6 earth radius one which is the one on the shortest period of only two and a half days that one's really hot uh might be rocky it might be a rocky planet but the rest of them which are all bigger than two earth radii are probably not they're probably uh volatile rich thick atmosphere sorts of things so um, one of our viewers put a question in there into the into the chat and he was trying to mostly yanker chains but um from quad Libet, if we can't hope to visit probe photograph any of these exoplanets why do we bother to look why waste money on that i think you know because we're curious and you know so i don't that's not the question that i think we really want to ask but it's just like how do you feel about having just these tantalizing little hints about the fact that these planets are there, but not being able to take it to that next level and get the kind of close up observations that we can with, say, the planets here in the solar system, that that gap, how does that not drive you crazy? Well, so Kepler, which has found most of these planets, uh, was designed to do the statistics to find out how common planets are. Were, are they everywhere in the galaxy? Does every star have planets? And it looks like most of them do. Uh, or were they incredibly rare? And until we launched Kepler, we didn't know the answer to that. So most of the planets found by Kepler are, as you say, too far away to measure their mass or examine their atmosphere or do anything. 
But that wasn't the point. And a few of them were bright enough and we have studied them. What we're really excited about, so when TESS launches and does this all sky survey, it's going to be sensitive to the nearest, brightest planets. Uh, and the whole point for that is to be a finder scope for JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope, which we also talked about. So it's going to be able to measure the atmospheres of these planets, of these close, bright planets that TESS finds in incredible detail. Uh, and we might even be able to start talking about looking for biosignatures, which is really exciting in my opinion. I mean, even if we can't go there, we can learn a lot about them. Yeah. Um, we, we, we've, we've had a, a biosignatures argument here on the, here on the show. Um, uh -oh. yeah, no, no, it's, it's, it's good. It's good. Tur turns out like all things, it's really hard. I believe is the, the yeah. that you can't just go point your telescope at the, at the planet and go, Oh, there's life there. That's yeah. So there were like a hundred years of exoplanet or 150 years of exoplanet detection claims before one was actually really solidly like, yes, absolutely. And I predict at least that much for right. biosignatures. Yeah, a hundred years of biosignature claims until one is... Until that, we have the smoking gun. Yeah, that sounds good. Scientists think long term. Uh, so now you, you mentioned that you've got the Citizen Science Project that people can get involved in. Where can people go to participate in this? Oh, yes. So they should go to exoplanetexplorers.org. Uh, we actually just uploaded a new year's worth of data, a full year of Kepler data, uh, a month ago, um, and what that that workflow, it's called a workflow, is not finished yet. We need at least 10 classifications per signal to get good, robust statistics, uh, and we're at about nine. So please go and, and help us finish out that year's worth of data. Uh, I've been looking at it, and so far, they uh, the citizen scientists have found 94 new planet candidates. So those are just candidates, but those are signals that look really promising. So now we have to go and do all the extra follow-up observations to say, you know, whether it's a real planet or a false positive or junk. Terrific. And you are, if people want to follow what you're doing, they can find you on the Twitters as well? I am. I'm on Twitter as at, Oni, at, uh, at Aussie Astronomer. I can't even say my own Twitter handle. Uh, so it's Aussie, A-U-S-S-I, Astronomer. We right couldn't on. fit in the E, the characters were too short. Well, Jesse, thank, thank you so Australia. much for joining us here on the Weekly Space Hangout. Uh, thank you. I, but as you said, you're going to stick around. So we're going to now have a quick conversation, an argument, a discussion, uh, a fun topic that uh, Paul threw in. I did. There was this interesting article of uh, releasing the results of a survey about what if we were to discover extraterrestrial life tomorrow? Would you freak out? Would you be blasé? Would you be happy? And the results were generally positive that people would be kind of excited and interesting. They wouldn't be worried about doomsday scenarios. They wouldn't be worried about uh, existential crises. They, it would be a perhaps a brief moment of celebration and curiosity. Woohoo! <laughs> Woohoo! Yeah. I don't know if I buy it. I don't know if <laughs> that would be our reaction. I don't know how that how long that reaction would last. Well, Wait, I guess what, what are our options? Aliens are coming here to like conquer the Earth and destroy the White House with a giant laser beam. <laughs> I'm sure some people would say that. that. But you're saying like they send it like we we make a detection of biosignatures and we've completed the hundred years of arguing and we're certain that it is indeed life on that other world. Maybe right. even we're able to detect some kind of techno signature. We can mm -hmm. see that there's pollution and we I, know I think that that's there's... all the difference. There's, I think the reaction will be really different if we think we found intelligent life than if we think we've found, you know, some dumb bog full of uh, bacteria or something. Don't you if, insult my bog. <laughs> if, we, if we think that we can try to talk to them, I think that will hold people's imagination far longer than just sort of it being a new shiny discovery in the science box of shiny things. But it would I mean, be... I I would still like that addition to the shiny box. Of well, duh, things. of course. Jesse, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think of all of the massive scientific discoveries that we've made so far. <clears throat> and, you know, people get up in the morning and they eat their cereal and they go and earn their dollars and they come home and they've shouted their children. And, you yeah. know, day to day, I don't think a lot changes. Um, maybe a lot more stupid pop popular philosophy books get written about our place in the universe. <laughs> 
Um, I mean, Sorry children, to be a no, 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 hey, I, I think you are sort of replicating the the uh, sort of the conclusion of the of this study here, which is that people would just like freak out, and then they would continue to back about their lives, and and they would just have this sort of little piece in their sort of little, one little chunk of their brain that's going, oh yeah, there's aliens on that planet over there. Hope they don't invade. I would still be really excited for just like fossilized bacteria on Mars. I'm just saying. I would still we, just be we really excited. Already ha we already had that, and like whales. people didn't get that yeah. excited. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't get that excited because it was so it. contentious. No. Well, but is it possible that we're ever going to find a biosignature that isn't as yeah. contentious? And in that, that case, seemed, the president of literally the United a message. I mean, an alien standing on a spaceship going, here I am, here, <laughs> here I am. Yeah. Space yeah. whales yeah. in your robot. Probably yeah. would be pretty obvious. Well, I mean, the president yeah. announced that they found life on Mars, right? Clinton, I remember. I was there for this. Uh, um, you guys, I think, were still children. Clinton um, is a known liar. That's why no one got excited. <laughs> but, but I was there for that, and people were remarkably chill after it. So, yeah. Meh. Meh. Well, and maybe it's because we'd been raising expectations over the years that life on Mars was, you know, a quite quite a distinct possibility. And in fact, maybe our life had started, like the idea that wasn't new. So it was more like a confirmation. Mm -hmm. um, so it'll depend, I think, whether, I, my, for my, I think the most interesting poll is for other for the general public. Do you think there are aliens out there? Because if the general sense is sure, we just haven't found them yet, then finding them will just be the same. Like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, okay, Check confirmation bias, great. Yeah, and if and if ninety percent of people don't think there's aliens out there, and then there are aliens, maybe that's more like, whoa, my whole worldview has shifted. I think it will also a lot depend on if the life is here in our solar system or outside the solar system. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So. Life in our solar system, people will be like, oh, so it kind of started and spread. That's cool. But what about the people who have had here UFO? Not... I was going to say, oh, people mm -hmm. who have had UFO encounters, right? They kind of dedicate their life to finding out more. So it's when you think about, can we about not, that, right? Can we not put UFOologists with SETI people? <laughs> well, no, no. Uh, <laughs> yes, we will because aren't yeah, they... Yeah, I'll go there. Aren't they kind yeah, of I'll similar? Like, is, isn't... Like, I understand that one is people uh, make, coming to an incorrect conclusion based on inadequ an inadequate amount of data and, and what other... Understanding what other possibilities are out there. But they, in their heart... Are have evidence proof that there is an alien civilization out there, and they are reacting accordingly, and that should give us some kind of guideline to how the rest of us, when actual proper evidence shows up, right? Well, but most of those people are dedicating their lives to either finding out more information or trying to prove it to other people. So, if the situation we're talking about here is we have the information and everyone believes it, then hmm. maybe their motivation to be quite so dedicated to the cause goes away. I think it increases because they'll, if there's some, if the, we know that there is definitely life outside the earth, whatever the form, then that just leads credence to uh, the, the concept UFO. of UFO and the concept of SETI. Because like, oh, you got step one, then the, the chances of there being intelligent spacefaring civilizations just goes up. So is there anyone here who doesn't think there's alien life somewhere in the universe? Just out of curiosity, me. Fraser has his Fraser has his hand up for yep. those listening. Yeah, I guess the listening can, nowhere... can't see that I put my hand up. <laughs> no, yes. no, nowhere in the universe do you think or the observable universe do you think there's life? Yes. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. That's harsh. That's harsh. Yeah. We're gonna have to debate that. <laughs> so, so, well, I, yeah. I will That's take. I will take. I will take that Fermi paradox great filter debate with anyone who wants to have it anytime, anywhere. So no problem. Uh, but I think most of people who are listening to this show know my position on it, which is the, you know, which is as we said, is the Fermi paradox. But I think this was a great idea, Paul, for you to throw into the end of this show a slightly contentious debate and uh maybe this is how we close so actually i think shows. fraser you're the only one that disagreed yeah with the entire panel yeah I, fine w wait I, I didn't disagree no wait a second i didn't disagree 
I I totally agree that people would you were like, people get numb. Being Look, you're disagreeing right now, Frazier. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm point. disagreeing with you saying that I'm disagreeing. Anyway, this got weird. Uh, let's move on. <laughs> Paul, uh, shamelessly self promote something that you're doing. Oh man, if you are not watching How the Universe Works on the Science Channel, you need to because I appear there occasionally waving my arms around like a maniac and talking way too excitedly about quasars and space time and all that good stuff. I believe there's only one episode left in the season on Tuesday, February 27th, but of course there'll be reruns. Check your local listings. Uh, and that's my TV stuff. You can also see all my internet stuff, podcasts, and YouTube shows by going to my website, PM sutter s-u-t-t-e-r dot com kimberly something cool you just did something cool i just did well i just published an article this morning on eos.org that's eos.org about a new global map of surface level ozone pollution because apparently ozone when you breathe it in is really really bad so don't do it so it's a good thing the stratospheric kind is really good the stuff that you can breathe is really bad the same ozone, just, you know, don't breathe it. But there's a new map of uh, global surface-level ozone pollution that I just wrote up on ES.org, so go check that out. And go follow me on Twitter at Astro Kim Cartier. Morgan. Well, Paul could not have provided me a better segue for a plug because if you're in the dfw area uh on tuesday march 6th i will be at the fort worth uh world of beer talking about the search for life in the universe and we will explore things like fraser's great filter and what it means to be alive and where we might expect to find some alien life so definitely swing by and check that out. Otherwise, you can find the rest of my stuff over at my website, morganrenberg.com. Right on. Uh, good news. Uh, we just delivered, by we I mean Dave Dickinson, and mostly it was Dave Dickinson, just delivered the first draft of, of our book, of the Universe Today's astronomy book, to the publisher. And so now we're doing all the photographic choosing and uh hopefully everything's going to be on track to have the book coming out by the end of the year so we should have dave on as a guest yeah we totally will once he is once he's allowed once with each other once we unchain him from the uh, computer then then (laughs) then he'll he'll show up as a guest and we'll be talking to him what was that paul i think our books are going to compete against each other Uh uh-oh first it's wrestling now it's books (laughs) yeah Thunderdome. With the, the body, and then we go to the mind. <laughs> right on. All right. And then a hot dog eating contest. It's time to wrap things up. It's over. It's ended. Thanks, we everyone. Have for, we have to go. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Thanks, as always, to the Weekly Space Hangout crew. They are, of course, the wonderful community of people that supply this chat down at the bottom and talk amongst each other. They supply the guests. I had no idea Jesse was going to be joining us today. Here she was. Thanks, everyone, at the Weekly Space Hangout crew. I don't even know who booked her. It just happened. And that's what happens when you become a member of the Weekly Space Hangout crew. You pretty much automatically become one of our executive producers, and you just tell us what to do and... It all works out. So if you want to go, go to wshcrew.space and join this awesome community. All right, I'm going to switch to the Beatty Brunch. There we all are. There they all are. Everyone say goodbye. We'll see you all next week. Bye.